Thank you very much, Brother Wendell. And I want to assure every one of you what a genuine delight and deep joy it is upon my part to be back in your great state of Texas and to be engaged in another great lectureship here at Brown Trail. This has become one of the real highlights of my year. I know that I speak the sentiments of every one of you, and I believe that we are truly having a great spiritual feast of good, of good things. Brother Hall, under whom I studied at Freed Hardeman a number of years ago, used to thank the Lord during lectureship week for the great feast of spiritual things which we are enjoying. And that meant so much to the late W. Claude Hall, and I know these great lessons mean so much to every one of us. I enjoy lectureships like these because they are book, chapter, and verse lectureships. I believe that they breathe the very spirit of Isaiah the prophet who declared in his generation to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah 8 and verse 20. I believe lectureships like this breathe the spirit of Isaiah 34, 16. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. They breathe the very spirit of our blessed Redeemer, who when asked a query in regard to what to do to inherit eternal life, said what is written in the law how readest thou? Luke 10 and 26. And certainly they breathe the spirit of Paul and his great Pauline argument in regard to the allegory uh, relative to Hagar and Sarah. As he said, nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Galatians 4.30. And then that remarkably fine pronouncement from Peter's pen, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. These have been the sentiments to which we as a people have long been committed, and yet some of our brethren apparently are not as committed to them as once was the case. But I'm glad that's not true with this lectureship, with this great congregation. And I truly appreciate the great work that is being done here in the Brown Trail School of Preaching, this great congregation, and all that is being done to promote the interest of the cause of our Lord. It's wonderful to be alive. It's wonderful to be a Christian. We are on our way to the land of Canaan, and we want to influence every one of our contemporaries to go with us as we have opportunity. There will be other speakers that will be dealing with First and Second Timothy and Titus, I have the privilege of dealing with some of these passages in our discussion this morning. However, before noting the three or four questions of a general nature and then some specific questions underneath, I want to say just a few things in regard to these three great books. They are favorites of mine, and I'm sure that they are favorites to every one of you. These three books ought to occupy the holy heartbeat of the life and, uh, and the labors of every gospel preacher. Brother H. Leo Bowles was born in the early part of the 1870s, a native Tennessean, and we're proud of that fact. He departed earthly scenes in 1946. Brother Bowles had the habit, I understand, of making it a point to read the books of First and Second Timothy and Titus every week. I don't know whether he had that habit all the years that he preached, but he preached about 50 years or more, and if he followed that habit all the years in which he preached, he read these three epistles through some 2,500 times. It's no wonder that when a person picks up the great biography written about him, I'll stand, or I'll stand on the rock, that one sees a picture of one who truly did the work of a gospel preacher. He had saturated his heart. He had filled his life with the very fundamentals of the gospel ministry. And in these 13 chapters of these three books, we find just what the gospel preacher ought to do. I have long believed that if we as preachers 
would read often these books, memorize the great verses that are found therein, and be able to convince our brethren that ours is a work that ought to be based upon what Paul told gospel preachers to do in the first century, that we would be doing a lot more than we currently are doing in order to win the world for Jesus Christ, to preach him and him crucified to the citizens of our day. But too many times our brethren want us to follow into or fall into the denominational categories expected of their so-called pastors instead of really learning what the work of a gospel preacher is all about. May I command to every one of you these three books as three inspired documents teaching what the life and labors of a gospel preacher ought to be. May I suggest in line with this that we work out a plan, and especially I would like to urge every young gospel preacher to work out a plan that will fit into your daily schedule where you spend a number of uh, hours every day in just studying the Bible. When I was about 18 or 19 years of age and had just begun to preach, I heard of an older preacher who had the habit of reading the New Testament through every month. I liked that idea, and I decided to subscribe to it. And I believe it's been one of the richest studies of my life, just simply staying with the text of the Bible and reading it again and again and again. One of the great pioneer preachers was Brother Jesse L. Sewell. He used to suggest on occasion that one of the reasons why I believe that the Bible is in the inspired Word of God is due to the fact that it is inexhaustible in its character. He suggested that I can pick up a book written by a man, and after reading it once or twice, I believe that I have what this man is capable of teaching me. But he said that's not true with God's book. When I finish reading it, I find that I need to back right up and begin to read it again. Such is the nature of the inexhaustible book that we have that ought to be the textbook, the daily guide to every one of us. I commend the study of the Bible as our primary study. That ought to be true with every one of us as members of the body of Christ and certainly ought to be true of every one of us as preachers of the gospel. But now to the text assigned for our study today, and we'll be dealing first of all with 1 Timothy 1 and verse 8 beginning how that the Apostle Paul suggested that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for... Uh, them who lie, them who commit perjury, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Exactly what does the apostle refer to when he mentions that the law is good if a man use it lawfully? I believe that he has reference to the law of Moses. I believe that the context actually demands this. Backing up to the very beginning of this chapter, we note that the apostle presents the salutation, verses 1 and 2, and then in verse 3, he tells Timothy why he had been left at Ephesus in order that he might charge certain ones not to teach any other doctrine. And then Paul mentions some of the doctrines that were being taught in Ephesus, doctrines that concerned him. He said there are some people who are far more interested in fables than they are the faith. There are some people who are far more interested in endless genealogies than they are the eternal gospel. 
They're interested in teaching that which just simply produces questions without any kind of profit. And Timothy was told, avoid these kind of teachers and their doctrines. Paul suggested that there are some who have turned aside unto vain jangling. Vain jangling is simply a lot of talk without any truth infused into it. It is simply a lot of conversation without really any content to underscore it. Paul suggested some have swerved aside from the truths of the gospel. He suggested that these men desire to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. They desired to tell about the law, yet they were minus of understanding, and their little comprehension, Paul pointed out, as being very significant. They know not what they say. Paul declares that there is a proper use to the law, that if a man uses it lawfully. I believe that we need to recognize that in regard to the law of Moses and implied in Paul's statement is this, that it can be used unlawfully, that it can be used improperly. And that's what concerned the Apostle Paul. He wanted brethren to make the right use of the law. There was a time in which Paul himself had used the law improperly. For instance, in subsequent verses, he declared himself to be a blasphemer, a persecutor, one who was deeply injurious to the cause of Christ. And while so engaged, he was truly using the law improperly. To use the law lawfully or properly means to recognize its purpose, to recognize its limitations, and to recognize its terminus or its end at Calvary when the Lord nailed it to the cross. What purpose did the law of Moses serve? Paul suggested in Romans 7 it was to make men aware of the sinfulness of sin. It was to restrain sin. Galatians 3 and verse 19, Wherefore then serve of the law, it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. It served as the great schoolmaster or the tutor whose purpose was to bring men to the cross. And Paul teaches in Galatians, the third chapter, now that the Savior has come, now that the faith of the gospel system has been brought to us, we're no longer under this tutor, no longer under the schoolmaster. Hence, we need to recognize the purpose and the use and the limitations of the law of Moses. It was never given as a worldwide law. Moses makes crystal clear in Deuteronomy 5 that the Lord our God gave not this covenant unto our fathers, but even us, even us, all of us who are alive this day. Deuteronomy 5, 3, 4, and 5. It was never given as a worldwide law, but given to the descendants of Jacob, the Israelite people. It was never given to be an eternal law, but given to last until the coming of the seed, at which time it had served its purpose. And yet men in Paul's day used it improperly. The Judaizing forces did this, and this called forth for much effort on the part of the Apostle Paul and others in order to defend the truth against the claims of Judaism. And there are men today who still use the Old Testament law quite improperly. Every time that a denominational preacher will hearken back to the Old Testament and try to make men and women amenable to it today, he is using the law improperly. A friend of mine some years back had an opportunity of talking to a Presbyterian preacher who had preached his doctrine for more than 40 years. And this friend of mine taught him the major difference between the covenant that came from Sinai and the covenant that had its beginning upon the day of Pentecost, Acts the second chapter. 
at the end of the study session, the preacher remarked, I've been preaching 40 years and never knew the distinction between what came through Moses and what came through the Messiah. Think how many people he had failed to teach the truth. Think how many people he had deceived and deluded, many of whom had already gone on into the great beyond. And there is a vast amount of teaching that needs to be done today in telling people the difference between that which came as statutes from Sinai and that which becomes the saving truth of Christianity as it began upon that memorable day of Pentecost. Every time that you sit down with a denominationalist in order to teach him the way of the Lord, in all probability you'll have to begin at least near the beginning and teaching him the difference between the Mosaic economy and the Christian dispensation. Paul suggested that there is a proper use for the law of Moses, and we need ever to recognize that. Also, the proper use of the law of Moses recognizes its end or terminus, the fact that it, as the great middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile, Ephesians 2.15, has now been broken down in order that Christianity might be erected and bring together Jew and Gentile, constituting them into what Paul calls this one new man. A beautiful, beautiful description, Ephesians 2 and 16. Paul teaches that the law has been nailed to the cross, Colossians 2, 14 through 17. He declares that it has been done away, 2 Corinthians 3. He declares in Hebrews, if he be that writer, 10 and 9, that the first was taken away in order that he might establish the second. It is true that the law of Moses did much in order to teach people what was wrong in sin. One of its purposes was to stop sin, to curb crime, and to develop decency within the human heart, as well as make fervent preparation for the coming of the Messiah and his religion of Christianity. Paul mentions a number of great sins, such as lawlessness. This is a person who doesn't have any respect for law. He mentions the disobedient. This is the person who has no respect for authority. He mentions the godless person or the ungodly. This is a person who lives without God in his life. He mentions the sinner. This is one who habitually misses the mark. He mentions the unclean one, the unholy one, the contaminated one. The profane person is the one who is void of reverence and respect for things sacred and divine. The person who respects law is the person who is not going to engage in murder, whether it be the murder of a father or a mother, the very ones that beget and bore him, or neighbors, either near or those distant. People who respect what the law of Moses sought to set forth and what sound doctrine in the New Testament suggests are not going to engage in immorality, fornication, adultery, homosexuality, and the like. They are not going to traffic in human flesh, that is, men-stealers, kidnappers, or taking people into hostage conditions which has aroused our country now for more than the last year. They are not going to be people who will lie in the family framework, in the social circle, or when upon the judicial seat they said. Not only did the law of Moses seek to curb these crimes, but sound doctrine has the same basic design. I believe this to be basically the teaching of First Timothy 1, 8 and 9. Now, our next set of questions deal with the eldership. A few things by way of observation in regard to the eldership. The qualifications of elders are set forth in 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1. Peter mentions a number of these in 1 Peter 5. But our, my remarks are 
uh, to be limited to 1 Timothy and the book of Titus. In regard to the qualifications of the eldership, they can be divided into various categories. For instance, there are the positives, there are the negatives. There are about twice as many positives as there are negatives. But those who are of the altogether positive persuasion, I think, would have a great deal of trouble in trying to really teach the whole counsel of God in regard to the eldership and never touch any matter that is negative in its nature. Again, they can be divided into about five general categories that deal with the man's character, the man's reputation, the man's Christian maturity, his leadership potential, as well as domestic requirements that touch his family. My remarks are going to be in this general area of these domestic requirements. Brother Deaver had a very fine observation yesterday in talking about the qualifications which are absolute in nature. A man is either married or he's not married. That makes it an absolute. And then there are relative. These are qualifications in which the man will continue to grow. A man that has served well as an elder for 40 years ought to be more apt to teach at, say, 65 with his health good than he was maybe when he first became a Christian, when he first became an elder. Not only that, but uh, there are qualifications that are perpetual, about which Brother Deaver mentioned yesterday. But now, as touching some of these matters in regard to his family or the domestic requirements, exactly what is meant by the expression that he must have faithful children? Does this demand that he have a plurality of children? Or will one faithful child who has obeyed the gospel living in the household of that elder, will that qualify him to serve in the eldership? I believe the latter to be the correct one. I do not believe that the Lord through Paul is simply stressing the arithmetic of a man's descendants so much as he is what he has done with the one or more that have been given to him as the great heritage of the Lord. And yet some brethren are far more interested in the arithmetic of the man's descendants than they are in how well he may have done with the one. On occasion I have talked with brethren who strongly contended that children means more than one. A failure, it seems to me, a total failure to recognize that the terms child and children are used interchangeably, synonymously, not only in the Bible, but even among us. Do you have children? Suppose you have but one. What answer would you give? Suppose you have three children still at home, and I ask you, do you still have a child at home? What answer would you give? We still use the terms interchangeably. They were so used in the Old Testament. Upon the birth of Isaac, Sarah is recorded as saying, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would give suck to children? Note the term children. For I have borne him a son. Note the singular in his old age. Genesis 21 and 7. The great year of the Jubilee, mentioned in Leviticus 25, suggests that the bondservant, along with his wife and children, would be given their freedom papers when the year of the Jubilee came around. What about the bondservant who had but a wife and one child? Because it mentioned children, would he still be retained as a bondservant, or would he be given his freedom? as he would have if he had two or more children. Uh, Proverbs 22 and 6 says, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Does that have something to say to the man that has children as well as the one who has a child? In the New Testament, Jesus made mention in Mark the 10th chapter, about the rewards of those who have forsaken their lands, their houses, their wives, their children, and other things for my sake. 
What about the person who puts the Lord above one child? Suppose he doesn't have children. Will his reward be any less? Again, in 1 Timothy, the fifth chapter, Paul talks about the widows and their enrollment in that great work. And he mentions one of the qualifications, if she have brought up children. What about the widow that qualifies in all these other areas, but was only blessed with one child? Would she be rejected because she had not children? Paul suggested that fathers should not provoke their children to anger or to wrath, Colossians 3.21, Ephesians 6.4. But what about the father who has but one child? Do not these passages apply to him equally well? I believe these passages indicate that child and children are used synonymously within the Bible. Two of the greatest men I ever served under, one of whom I still do, and the eldership have been blessed but with one child. But both of them have done a tremendously good job in the rearing of the, of the child in each of the households. Another question that sometimes comes up, and that is, what about the elder and the qualification husband of one wife? Does that mean that he has to be a married man? Well, it's obvious that it would be pretty difficult for him to have his household in order and to have faithful children, one or more, unless he had a wife to aid him in this process. I believe that if the Scripture means that he's not to be a bigamist, that it also prohibits his being a bachelor. Husband of one wife, I believe, means husband of one wife that this is not to be filled by those who are not family men, but men who are blessed with a fine family to aid them in this great work. Now, in regard to husband of one wife, another question comes up. Well, now, what if the elder loses that one wife? That perhaps has been by his side as helper, as companion, as um, inspirational helpmate all these years, suppose she dies. Does that mean the next Sunday he ought to tender his resignation? This question came up in the open forum yesterday. Brother Franklin Camp expressed precisely the views that I placed in the book. So did Brother Roy Deaver. There might be occasions, if it's going to cause trouble in the congregation, when it would be expedient for the man to go ahead and resign. But if those conditions do not prevail, it's my firm conviction and has been for many years that he could certainly continue to serve in the eldership. Brother Deaver brought up yesterday, and this I also placed in the book, what if a man has two faithful children today? He's serving in the eldership. They are both killed on their way home from school one afternoon. Yesterday, he had two faithful children. Today, he's bereft of any children. Does that mean next Sunday morning he's to resign because he no longer has two faithful children? I never have believed that at all. Another question that sometimes comes up, now what about an elder whose children were faithful to him, to the Lord, all the days that they lived in his household. Now they've been on their own, away from home, years. They now have families of their own, and they're no longer faithful as they once were. Should that man resign? Again, there might be conditions in the congregation that might make it expedient for the man so to do. But I believe that we need to recognize that Paul's talking about children who are still in his household. He mentions in 1 Timothy 3, 4, that the man is to have the proper rule of his household. When that son or daughter are both gone, they no longer are members of his immediate household, no longer under his roof, no longer put their feet under his table three times a day. I believe that it's grossly unfair to suggest here's a man that brought up his children to the very best of his ability has done an effective work for the Lord all the days of his eldership, and yet five, ten, twenty years after his children are away from home, one of them ceases to be faithful 
Therefore, it's the essential imperative that he resign. I do not believe this scripture so obligates the man. But again, it might have to be decided in regard to how the congregation might view the matter. If it's going to cause trouble in the congregation, a split in the congregation, no elder would want that upon his record when he went to judgment. But so much for these questions. One or two more I have included in the book. But I want to say just a little something in the closing moments about the women about which we read in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 11. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. I've given you the quotation from the KJV. You'll notice, though, that two of these words, uh, must and there, are placed in italics, which means they are supplied words. It was the interpretation of the KJV translators that it referred to the wives of deacons. The American standard simply uses women instead of wives there, which I believe to be the correct understanding of that verse. Is Paul talking about the wives of deacons? Is he talking about the wives of elders? Or is he talking about a group of special women, special female servants who had been given a task to do, an assignment to perform? I believe the latter to be the correct one. If he's talking about wives of deacons, it strains that he had nothing to say about whether they are faithful wives and faithful mothers, and yet he had mentioned both of these points in regard to elders and in regard to deacons. Why not mention something along that line if he were simply talking about the wives of deacons? I believe this verse can partially be understood in view of some of the statements that we have in 1 Timothy 5, as Paul gives various qualifications for women who were in position to serve the church in certain capacities as uh, female servants. And uh, no doubt they often did that in the first century, just as there are certain works even among us that no elder could do personally, that he could not, or rather the eldership could not, uh, say to a deacon, you go and take care of this, because it might involve a poor widow, lay, a poor widow. it might in, uh, regard one, a lady who is sick and needs personal attention, it might regard or might have reference to some uh, very touchy problem in which a young lady needs some instruction about the facts of life. And I thought Brother G.K. Wallace hit it right on the nail, or read it, really hit the nail on the head some years back, when he suggested older women ought to be used in order to teach younger women in regard to their role as wives, as mothers, and uh, things along this line. And there are just areas in these departments where godly women who've had the experience, who have the dedication, can certainly function and function well. And in order to do so, they would need such qualifications as Paul here gives, that they be faithful in all things, that they be grave, that is, dignified and a proper department, that they be sober, that is, temperate, under self-control, literally holding themselves in, not giving over to the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life and that they be women who will adorn the doctrine of God with these four special qualifications that he lists. Do we have official deaconesses in the church today? I do not believe so. I believe it's to read something into this passage not there to suggest that we ought to have official deaconesses in the church today. It's significant to me that when Paul addressed the Philippian congregation, he did not say to the elders or bishops, to the deacons and to the deaconesses at Philippi, but he did make mention of the bishops or overseers and uh, the deacons. Brother Guyan Woods, in one of the last quarterlies that he wrote, suggested that there is absolutely nothing here in 1 Timothy 3.11
or anywhere else in the Scripture that authorizes us to do, as many Protestant bodies have done, that is, have appointed women to serve as official deaconesses. I believe that women have a work to do, but not as official deaconesses. These are some of the great texts about which questions are raised in First and Second Timothy and the book of Titus. May I suggest that by way of closing that there's a vast amount of difference between a difficult passage and an impossible text. I believe these are difficult that we are discussing here, but I do not believe that the Lord has put any impossible text in his book. To me, that would reflect on his goodness and on his wisdom. He gave us a revelation of his will. And uh, we need to study the difficult ones, but I do not believe that they are impossible of understanding. Simply because I may not understand them doesn't mean that somebody else may not understand them. We certainly ought to want to avoid the pride of a young man about whom I heard years ago a promising gospel preacher he was in his late teens and early 20s. He went on into higher education, and in one of the universities he attended, one of his professors threw out an argument against the existence of God that he couldn't answer. And it began to throw him toward agnosticism, ultimately into infidelity, and finally into almost atheism. How unfortunate that the young man did not realize that just simply because I don't know the answer to what the infidelic professor was spilling out for us, that nobody else knows the answer also. How fortunate it would have been if he had gone to some older and seasoned veteran among us and said, I have a problem. One of my professors has presented to us help me to find the answer to it. These are difficult passages. They challenge us, and rightly so. Thank you.